Hello everyone, this is uh, Chris back again with the Ancient Scholar. I'm here back in our um, our lab, actually, in the respiratory therapy uh, program. And um, I wanted to just show you some of the external equipment uh, that we would use to, uh, for setting up uh, a patient, um, a person, on hemodynamic monitoring. Uh, specifically, the three modalities that we talked about a little earlier, uh, the art line the central uh, venous catheter and the pulmonary artery catheter. Um, of course, there are a couple of other modalities, such as intracranial pressure monitoring, uh, which would be, it may be a slightly different setup. And I'm not really going to talk about intracranial pressure monitoring, even though it is is sort of a, a, a hemodynamic um, a variable that we can monitor, because uh, when we look at intracranial pressure, and if we can monitor that directly, we can calculate something called the cerebral perfusion pressure, which is actually very important uh, when we talk about um, uh, traumatic brain uh, injury, stroke, uh, be it ischemic or hemorrhagic. Uh, the, the concept of cerebral perfusion pressures uh, can be very important. And, of course, uh, we would need to monitor the um, intracranial pressure and be able to monitor the mean arterial pressure. Uh, to calculate that, but we'll talk about that a little later on. I just want to show you kind of some of the equipment that we would use externally to set somebody up into hemodynamic monitoring. So the first thing I want to show you guys is, is um, something known as the transducer. Now these can come in all kinds of different um, shapes and configurations, but they all generally do about the same thing. So this right here is, is, a, is what's known as a transducer, specifically this here. And what basically we're looking at is if you can um, see, I'll show the bottom part here for you guys. Um, this little connection looks kind of like an IV tubing, but you'll notice that the tubing has kind of a very hard, non-compliant feel to it. And we actually want this tubing to be very hard and to be non-compliant as opposed to the, the typical IV tubing, um, which, which is more of a plush feel to it. Um, Again, it's going to be very important uh, because what this does is this is actually hooking to the distal part of the invasive line, be it uh, maybe um, something in my subclavian, be it a pulmonary artery catheter, or a central line, or you know maybe I have an art line in place. And we'll talk about those separately in different videos. Um, what this does is this hooks into the distal monitoring end of, of whatever um, line we're looking at. And what it does is, um, as uh, because we talked about, uh, really the circulatory system is nothing but uh, gradients of, of, of pressures, different pressure gradients. Um, this actually, uh, that pressure, let's say um, I'm monitoring in an artery, um, and you can imagine, you know, as a heart beats, as we go into systole, of course, there's a certain pressure um, that's distributed throughout uh, whatever system we're monitoring uh, during both systole and diastole. And those waves of pressure, of course, can travel through um, fluid. Um, in, in this case, you know, it'll be a solution. Um, generally, normal saline. Uh, some places are still using um, some heparinized saline solutions. But what have you, that wave of pressure is going to travel through this line until it gets to this transducer here. And uh, what happens is that wave of pressure, in essence, slams into this transducer, and that um, wave is then uh, essentially transformed into an electrical signal. Um, and that electrical signal then travels through a cable that uh, connects to, to a monitor. To, this will actually connect to another cable, and that cable will go into a monitor. Uh, there are different uh, types of uh, cables. These are, this is a kind of a telephone jack, and has a square shape, um, where this is more of an, an oval shape. And these are probably the two most common shapes you'll run into, the square and oval. Um, so that's really how a transducer works. So it, that's what we mean by transducing a um, invasive line. Is they're transducing a pressure and we're turning it into an electrical signal that can be monitored. Um, so hopefully there's there's a little bit of intuition there. Um, now when we set up for uh, hemodynamic monitoring, we need to have a pressurized system, and generally we do that uh, through the agency of um, some sort of pressure bag. And what you can do is you can see this pressure bag. You go ahead and inflate that pressure bag. 
And most of them will have some sort of a manometer on there. And hopefully you guys can see this. Uh, this is just one of many. And as I put pressure in there, this little thing will pop up, and eventually it'll, it'll get into a green zone, uh, about 300 millimeters of mercury, any higher, and it'll say caution red. But most of these devices are designed um, to be pressurized at about 300 millimeters of mercury. And at 300 millimeters of mercury, um, there, there's a little, little valve that opens up in here um, that allows fluid to very, very, something like 3 milliliters an hour, just flow ever so slight, um, slightly and slowly uh, through this line. And again, we need to have an open conduit, right? We need to have... Um, fluid uh, all the way through this line, otherwise those, those waves of pressure can't be transduced. So if my pressure becomes real low in the bag, and you know perhaps this the little valve in there closes, um, obviously I'm not going to be able to transduce any, any pressure from the patient. So I inflate this to 300 millimeters of mercury. I need to get all the air out of the line. It's very, very important. We'll talk about something called damping, um, under damping and over damping, uh, probably in um, other videos. And if I get any air bubbles in the line, uh, we know that waves, uh, of course, can change as they go through different medium uh, mediums. Um, and you know, you, you you probably notice this when maybe when I put a fork in a glass of water, and it kind of looks like the fork um, is 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 been broken or shifted. And and that's just simply because the light, uh, of course, light is a wave as the light transitions through the water. Um, it's it's bent. Um, you, you know, there's some reflection, there's some refraction, uh, things of that nature. Well, so, um, pressure waves are, are are very very much the same, um, the same principle. If they transition from fluid, say through an air bubble, um, that is going to change uh, the characteristic of that wave, and and clearly that's going to change um, what we're monitoring. So that's actually something very important <clears throat> that we we need to have a an air free system. Very important. Okay, just a couple of other um, characteristics of some of these systems. Um, so this is one um, that's that's really common. Uh, I talked about the transducer here. Uh, this is um, these little wings here. This is for what's called a fast flush, and you actually push these these wings, and it opens a big valve in here, and I can flush fluid through real quickly. And I can do I can do that for a couple of different reasons. Um, maybe I can check the patency of the line. Maybe I can do a, what's called a damping test, and, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but in any event, I can flush uh, through there, uh, through the agency of these little wings. Now, some devices, um, instead of having wings, will have a little, little, little thing like this. Um, its a slang term is a pigtail, and you actually pull that, and it opens a valve, but it's just the same as squeezing the wings. And of course, uh, the transducer is right here. Now, another thing that you'll probably run into is a little connector like this. This is actually called a vamp. And what this allows you to do is it allows you, um, if you can see, I can pull back on this like so. And when I pull back, I can pull back blood from the patient and pull blood back, back, back through this. Um, and what that allows me to do is that actually allows me to take a blood sample through this port. I get my blood, and then, and then I push this back in until it clicks, pushes it back in. I get a click, and then I go ahead and, <clears throat> through that little pigtail that I showed you earlier, flush the rest of the blood through. And that's actually a really common way that we can draw blood, um, say from an art line by the agency of this this little thing called a vamp here, and there are other devices that are that are similar to the vamp. Okay, <clears throat> one more thing about setting um, this guy up: um, the transducer is designed to be zeroed. We have to zero it every time we use it because um, it has to take into consideration atmospheric pressure. Um, now it's very fickle about where we zero it, and generally where we want to zero these guys are, are, are at, at, at something known as the phlebostatic axis, and that's at approximately the level of the right atrium. Um, so it's going to be right, right about in here. Um, I know when we fly, generally what we'll do is we'll actually just tape the transducer to the chest wall. <clears throat> in the um, ICU or in the hospital, uh, generally what you'll see is on the IV pole, uh, there will be a little level, um, and literally they used to use carpenter levels back in the day from what I understand, um, but you'll have a little level, a little box with some slits in 